are ready to start and we are um, still asking for any questions that you guys may have in the chat box. So if you're not sure how to do that on the main page of this um, tool thing, on the left-hand side, you can look at the Webinar Jam Studio. And then in the chat, um, you can type in what information you'd like to talk about. Um, again, we want to talk about um, review information to um, give you guys any information that we have about the review situation with Amazon. Um, some of the things that we also want to talk about are uh, dealing with Chinese holidays for those of us who are, are doing um, work in the, the private label development space. And then some other issues that we've been seeing happen with the safety takedowns. And then um, one really interesting one that we had this week that we want to talk about for um, a product that was taken down for not meeting a uh, product safety standard. That's a pretty unusual situation. Okay, so again, um, if anyone has a question, let us know. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. So, um, Kelly, when we were when we were talking earlier this week, uh, I know we, we all scrambled to get our message out on Monday about the review situation. So um, that's obviously a huge deal for everybody, and uh, would love to get your feedback on that. Well, this has been a long time coming based on a lot of the actions that I think Amazon has been uh, signaling and actively doing in the marketplace for probably six to nine months. Um, as sellers who know who have been paying attention, uh, Amazon's been very much going after third-party review sites that they felt were infringing upon Amazon's TOS, and they were. Um, unfortunately, many sellers have come to rely on using those to uh, boost their reviews because they were having a hard time getting them organically. And you know, as it goes, when you see someone doing something and it seems like it's okay, many people will follow that example, which you know, Amazon doesn't really care about that. Uh, so now we have the uh, the two recent changes. The first of which was the announcement that. Uh, the buyer policy had changed, uh, but then the seller side, and that's the big one where I think people are really probably very nervous and, and understandably so, but the bottom line is this, is Amazon has kind of drawn the line in the sand. They have removed the incentivization of reviews. What's going to replace it? Um, I guess that depends on your point of view, doesn't it? Um, as you and I discussed, sellers who have been following the rules, I think are going to see a boost in their overall review uh, percentages on their ASINs, ASINs that may have been performing poorly actually might improve, which would be great. Uh, I know that we have several clients that would be happy to see that. Um, but for those who have not been following the actual letter of the law for Amazon, I think that they're gonna be scrambling to find a new way to do their, their reviews. And so really I think it's for them to go back to the drawing board, review the rules and understand that they really have to put themselves out there the way that the original rules were intended to do, which is the spirit of it is not to try to drive people with incentive, ask, accept when they won't do it, and move on and, and just try to do it the right way. So it's going to be interesting to see how people react over time and what other uh, things Amazon does. I've heard some rumblings that a lot of reviews have been taken down. Uh, and I would expect to continue to see that happen as well as potentially a wave of enforcement against people that Amazon may view to still be using the incentivization approach, which is not okay. So I think that's what we're going to probably see for the remainder of October into early November. So when we first sent out our notification on Monday, what mm -hmm. we had talked about was basically stopping all in-flight um, campaigns. Um, yes. So I know we, we've in the past recommended using Snagshout. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other review tools didn't have quite as good of an adherence to Amazon Terms right. of Service, so we like the way that Snagshot works. Um, but even so, if you had a required um, incentivized campaign running, it needed to stop immediately. Yep. And the other thing that we recommended was to tell all existing reviewers, anyone who had currently gotten the product, to not yep. review. Yep. and ask anyone who had reviewed to take it down. And yep. when we talked about that, the main reason was because of how, uh, let's say a, ni a nice way to put this, uh, how carefully, shall we say, Amazon interprets its policies. <laughs> yes, well, and um, <laughs> to, to David's question in the chat box is what kind of grace period do we see for reviewers with the product from the review sites? And I don't know that there is any. Um, Amazon yeah, was very exactly careful. Right. If they were, and you probably noticed this too, Rachel, they were very careful not to say anything about that in their most recent press release and in, in the VP's blog post. And I think that that's by design because they've obviously launched some new enforcement tools that 
probably are automated uh, to try to scrub data that they view to be poor uh, and, and against TOS in the review population. So I honestly don't think there is much of a grace period. So to your point, Rachel, I think the most immediate action should be pulling those campaigns and making sure you reach out to people and say, stop what you're doing before this becomes a problem. But yeah, no grace yeah, I mean, period, I don't think, David. I, I completely agree. And just, just from experience working with the enforcement teams, um, I would suspect that part of this is, um, so, so there are two things that kind of we've, we've seen recently that were a bit of a surprise. Um, the first obviously was the biggest surprise was the reviews issue. But the other was the um, takedown that we recently worked on for images and image listings. Yes. Yes, there's been a lot of that. In fact, uh, I would say in the past week, in addition to that case, I've actually seen two more sellers that had um, extensive action taken against them by Amazon for image related issues. Now, neither of those sellers ended up with any kind of suspension on their record, which was great. Um, but I, w I thought it was really interesting to see that there's finally this push to do some cleanup of the category. The problem that I see though, is that these messages are very vague and they don't explain to the seller what is actually the problem. And as you and I discussed with that, with that other case, um, there can be a lot of ambiguity because the rules at the site level say this, but the rules at the category level may be even contradictory mm -hmm. depending. Um, and so it's difficult for sellers to, uh, I think, navigate those. But I think sellers who are doing private label in particular should be very aware that they need to check what they're doing against the site level as well as the category level. And when in doubt, feature the product only. Make sure it's taking up 85% of, of that uh, photo and make sure that you're using white backgrounds. Pay for that quality photography if you can't do it yourself because it's not going to be worth getting your account suspended for something that's a relatively easy fix. It's something that you should be doing as a matter of course. It should be a best practice. Yeah, we just we just posted a blog post on this and the, the image that I used was of a woman wearing a track suit and a headband and the equivalent issue for the, the seller that I talked to you about was basically the headband was what was listed. Um, obviously, it wasn't actually a headband, um, but in this situation, the headband hypothetically would mm -hmm. be what was listed and the lifestyle image, which mm -hmm. is really common in mm -hmm. the image section, would be the woman with the tracksuit. Right. And they specifically called out the hypothetical tracksuit as the problem. Right. You know, a which had no branding on it either. Really, really <laughs> surprising. Yeah, well, and, and there's a couple of different reasons why that could be. And, and I think, Emily, we touched on this a little bit, is that uh, when we were diagnosing, there's always this issue of, is this something everyone else is doing or is it something that is really actually part of the rules? And, and like you said, Rachel, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes depending on the way that the uh, subcategory rules are written. But yeah, I, I, could, I definitely think we're going to be seeing an increase of this towards, um, towards the beginning of Q, you know, really getting to the Q4 push. And Emily, this kind of dovetails with what you do with A plus content. Don't you think that's probably the solution to a lot of these sellers' problems? In terms of making sure that they're compliant with terms of service. Well, not only that, but also just making sure that they're doing that, but doing the best that they can with their content. Because obviously, if they're they're putting out the good images, they're they're boosting their ranking, they're helping their review requests because people are going to want to review a product they like looking at. Absolutely, similar to the idea of leveling the playing field with taking yes. away the incentivized reviews. Yes. It's extremely important to make sure that you're meeting terms of service because they are intended to make you the best seller, put your best face uh, toward right. your buyers. And so it does behoove you to make sure that you are meeting terms of service and paying close attention to what those are because it'll keep you out of trouble too. It'll keep you above the fold when it comes to all of these things that Amazon is coming after these other sellers about. You know, right. if you've already familiarized yourself with the terms of service and you know exactly what should be in your images, then right. you don't have any problem and you don't have to worry about these emails coming to you wondering, why do you mean track suit? I don't yes. know. Yes, exactly, exactly. The same requirement doesn't apply for A+, right? That's the, that's the main exciting part about this is mm -hmm. that if you do qualify for A+, then you can do whatever lifestyle image you want. You can do whatever text you want. Mm -hmm. Correct. Definitely. Yeah. So I think it's an interesting example of a very delayed push towards cleaning up of the category. In addition to the images, I've also seen a number of sellers getting warnings for uh, in what Amazon has termed uh, 
improper contributions to ASINs. Um, there seems to be some, uh, I don't know, inconsistency with what sellers are being told with that as well. Uh, sellers who are in the Amazon brand registry are getting these notices, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you consider what the Amazon brand registry is supposed to do. Um, but I have seen <laughs> other sellers who are not in it that are also getting it. So um, whether the enforcement is correct on, on the first example or not, the second example is definitely happening. Um, so there is a renewed emphasis on trying to clean up the category uh, or the, not the category, but just the catalog integrity issues that have long plagued the site in terms of duplicates, bad data, bad titles, bad photos. So I'm glad to see that. I just yeah, wish I it was a little it's clearer. About time, right? Yeah, it's about time. This was this was a pet, pet project of mine in seller performance. I absolutely love trying to help get these things off the ground. I did a lot of work with clothing to try to help them get their category cleaned up. Uh, so I'm glad to see this kind of expanding beyond that, but I just, again, now from the outside, I would like to see just a bit more clarity for what sellers are being asked to do and, and review. No more guidance. So we did have a question from um, David again about the, the review removals. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually have seen a lot of this chatter on the Facebook groups, and I'm going to put out a, a prediction and you guys can can tell me if I'm right or not in the next couple of weeks and months I suspect that a lot of the paid uh, reviews are going to be taken down that's that's yes. my prediction, that they're going to use the language to find them and take them down I, I think so um, I think and when when posts like that came out or like the one that that spurred all this came come out I always think the unsaid is almost more important than what is said because to me knowing what i know from the inside that means that there's a, a wave of enforcement coming and it may not necessarily take the form that one expects and it may not happen immediately but it's going to come and i do think that's the next piece i agree i see carla also made a, a comment about uh, mm -hmm. reviewers um planning i don't know that i honestly don't know that most of these groups are going to be able to meet tos um, if Amazon thinks that you're doing something to violate the sp spirit of the rules, they will take action. Absolutely. So that that particular, like Amazon's not about, it's not the same way as say like a warning message with a government agency. And as long as you have the right warning message, then you're okay. They're really about the integrity of the community. And if they mm -hmm. think that the reviewer is violating that, they'll sue the reviewer. And they have. I don't yes. remember how many it was, but it was over a thousand reviewers got sued yes. in the last batch or something ago. Yes, I believe it was over a thousand, and there were some that were, you know, from relatively large companies as well, or had relatively prolific activity on the site. So I don't think that they're uh, they're going to shy away from taking action, and I think it's very, very likely that we'll see an increase not only in warnings but in suspensions and permanent uh, blocking from the platform too. Yeah, I completely agree. If they've made this choice, they're going to go full steam ahead. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. At this point, like like you said, it's like this is the hill they've chosen to die on. It's taken them a long time to get here, but I think that the signs and signals have really been there for about a year. Uh, and I, I think we even had this conversation in July when, when we were last together. I said, I, I think it's coming, and it, here we are, and it's the perfect time because it's preceding the holidays. Although I'm a little surprised they did it now. I kind of thought maybe Q1, but nope. They're going for it. Go big or go home, I guess. <laughs> they came out before November, right? <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. Other thing that I've seen on the Facebook groups, it's something that, that Dustin just um, popped up in the in the question, um, is a bunch of people saying that they've gotten requests to notify Amazon of their multiple accounts. And this was actually something that came up at the women's conference in Seattle a couple months ago. And yeah. um, in the hallway conversation that was later relayed to me, so one of those kind of things. Yeah. Um, what I was told through the grapevine was that Amazon is specifically going after people with unapproved multiple accounts. Um, they've Interesting. Known, but this was apparently an actual active choice to shut down multiple accounts. Yes. Well, and I'm glad this actually came up, Dustin. Thank you for asking this question. Uh, I spoke with someone today who received um, an interesting variation on the original notifications for multiple accounts that uh, I can remember writing several years ago uh, that comes up. Uh, it actually is asking you for uh, kind of this fact finding. Are you having a multiple account? If it meets any of these exceptions, please disregard this notice, which is new. I've not seen that before. So it's kind of interesting that they're doing it in this uh, almost an honor system sort of way. Um, if you are not operating another account, if you uh, have never registered another account, I think you're fine. Uh, but there are a lot of people who do this kind of, I don't know, initial first foray in trying to sell, they register an account, maybe they never really did anything with it, they forget about it. 
And that will come back to haunt you, especially if you never actually shut the account down and you had active listings because that account could have just gone into a, a negative from a performance standpoint and they closed it down. You didn't know, maybe you didn't have the email. So if there's a potential situation like that, that's something that you should try to remember, pry it from the wells of your memory and, and admit to it. Because as we often say, being honest and falling on the sword when you've made a mistake is the best thing you can do for yourself with Amazon. So um, Chris, if you didn't have a... Just tell them. The other option is to uh, never bring it up and try to cover your tracks as best as possible. Yes, that and sometimes that's more important. It's hard, to, it's hard to trick Amazon. Yeah, well, absolutely, and I don't recommend it because a lot of times they're two steps ahead of you. Um, but Chris, to your point, if, if you got that email and you don't have a second account that you know of, I mean, it's, it's fair to write to Amazon and say, thanks, I've received your notice, and I've never registered for another account. This is the only one I'm selling through. Thanks. I mean, you know, it's it's up to you whether you respond. I don't think it's required based on the, the wording of the message is more of, if this doesn't apply to you, please disregard, which is rare that Amazon gives you the option not to respond. So maybe it's time to take that when it happens. So I'd like to kind of um, pivot towards our next topic. And um, if you have any questions about the performance stuff, then please do definitely bring them up. Um, but the next thing I wanted to talk about were, were safety takedowns. And um, there are two kinds of safety takedowns that, that we see. And the first one has been around for a long time. And it was actually the team that I managed back in 2010, 2011, and the team that Emily worked in. Um, and that's product compliance. And they do regular takedowns. Um, they do takedowns on the vendor side. They do takedowns on the seller side. And it's all based on safety issues. So if a customer writes in and says something like, I plugged it in and it lit on fire. Well, that's obviously a safety issue and someone's going to take a look at it. Um, and that's done primarily through reviews. Um, so there's a new team that just, we just started seeing um, the warnings for it. Gosh, what was it, Kelly? June? So when we started seeing the first one? May. It actually started in May. So it was, it's, it's now about five months, five months along or so. Mm -hmm. And they're actually coming from product quality. So that's a very different situation than product compliance. Compliance is really focused on your paperwork. Did you actually get listed? Do you have test reports? Are you registered if that's appropriate? Whereas product quality is primarily and has been traditionally um, focused on item quality and customer perception. So I kind of wanted to go over some of the examples um, that we've been talking about lately. Uh, the, the UL 588 request and then just some of the situations with the reviews that we've been seeing come in where someone will say that they barfed or they were nauseous which is typical for certain kinds of products and it gets taken down so what do you do yeah that's a that's a really great question i think uh amazon always expects particularly with item based issues that you the seller are doing a root cause analysis regardless of what the source of the of the issue is whether they email you and say you've gotten returns or they think something is inauthentic or it's you sold as new you should be doing a root cause analysis and that's what i have been working with clients on uh, very consistently um, there are two main areas that i look at particularly with these safety issues and one of them is reviews um, and this oh, is very you, applicable We've seen this issue with PL sellers and resellers. Yes, I and I, I yeah, <laughs> there's so much to say about that. But yes, primarily with private label sellers, um, the the issue is across both though. And so uh, if you are reselling, you are still responsible for the product that you sell on Amazon and that includes the safety, even though you are not the manufacturer. So keep that in mind. Um, but for those of you selling private label, this is a huge issue, this, this new safety incident stuff that product quality is doing because it seems to come out of nowhere in some ways, but there are two main sources I think that they're looking at and that's returns and your product reviews. And if you are a private label seller creating your own ASINs, you need to be monitoring those product reviews. And if you see anything that indicates safety, whether it's a, a physical reaction, uh, electrical shock, fire, um, a, a piece of uh, the product breaking off in a forceful manner that could injure somebody in the eye or something like that, you need to be looking at these things and immediately taking steps to rectify. And I don't just mean refunding that customer and saying, I'm sorry. I mean, you need to think about pausing your listing entirely and going back and looking at what could possibly be causing that. Obviously, as Rachel said, some things are going to be one-offs. Um, supplements are a huge issue. 
uh, nausea, headache, uh, all these things that you can see with a supplement can be attributed to very external factors. That doesn't matter. You are still responsible for knowing what could be causing these problems and taking action. And that, again, is more than mollifying that customer. It's doing that deep dive backwards into what you're seeing and going, do I need to test my product in the FCs? Do I need to remove it and see Oh, wow, is it adulterated? Has temperature fluctuation impacted the efficacy of the product? Uh, did somehow some returns get put into sellable that shouldn't have been? There's a lot of things that I think you need to do as a seller, but it all is a reverse engineering back to the beginning, and it starts with product reviews and returns. Yep, always paying attention to those returns, even though you don't get the exact reason why, at least you know if it's not as described or defective and can follow up with that customer. Yes. Um, so Emily, if, if we got a question from a, a seller saying something like, Amazon just asked me if my Christmas lights are UL588 listed. Um, the first thing is, why are they asking that? What, what is the point of asking if something is UL listed? What is UL listing? And um, what is the problem with Christmas lights? What is the problem with Christmas lights? <laughs> <laughs> why, why are they asking about that in particular? Um, well, because they are so easy to get here into the States and uh, they don't necessarily have to be proven to be safe. It's not until after there's a problem that the questions come through and uh, there's an issue and then you have to prove it. Um, so I think it's really... What kind of problems did you see when, when you were actually looking at these kind of things? What kind of things should sellers be on the lookout for? Lots of fire, lots of hot, <laughs> lots, of, lots of, I plugged it in and all of the electricity in my house went out. <laughs> lots, wow. of, um, lots of things like that. I also saw a lot of reviews where people were, of course, after the fact, because I don't think that a lot of customers do think to, you know, open up their package and go, oh, does this have a UL mark on it? Um, they just don't think about it until later. And then, so I saw a lot of reviews that were like, oh, uh, this actually doesn't have any markings anywhere. It doesn't say you well, or it has this other mark that doesn't make any sense at all. I've never seen this. What does this mean? <laughs> or they put like a photo of the burned out, you know, plug in there and the, the plug doesn't actually have any information on it. Um, so yeah, those are, those are things to look out for. Um, as a seller, you know, with any products, it's important to know where the product came from and to make sure that it's going to be safe. And I suppose to think about potential hazards before you actually decide to go into the business of selling things like Christmas lights, <laughs> you know, can it catch on fire? It's an electrical device. You know, where did you get it from? Did you buy it from someone's garage sale? Um, you know, did you get it from grandpa's estate? Uh, you know, where did they come from and um, are they safe? Would you uh, feel comfortable with your own family using them? Do you use them? Uh, you know, good things to think about before you try and sell products. So you mentioned that it's really easy to import um, items even if they're not compliant. Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Um, well, what I mean is that um, not everything gets checked when things are imported, when they hit U.S. shores. Um, you can't be sure that just because it's being sold in the States that it's actually a legit safe product. Um, some things, of course, do get stopped and searched and checked, but not all things do. Um, so you should never assume that just because you're buying something um, that it's safe, which is sometimes a lesson hard learned, I suppose. But yeah, and it's not, all, not all things do get checked. It's not like there's someone, um, you know, at all the ports with a clipboard making sure that, you know, those Christmas lights are safe. <laughs> they're, they're image. Like if you can imagine every container in the world and every port in the world, my people with clipboards, like. Right, oh, well, it's, it's not feasible. It would be wonderful, but it's, that's mm -hmm. that it works. It's, important it's important as a consumer to take responsibility for what you're buying but it's as a seller and that's you know I think a lar in large part what this whole conversation is about as a seller you need to be taking responsibility for what you're selling and it's not okay to just go to you know a liquidation sale and just buy up a whole bunch of stuff because you think you can make a profit on it um, what is that thing that you're selling is it okay do you know where did it come from can you prove where it came from 
Um, you know, do you know what gray market is? Do you know? Um, do you know? And if you don't know, it's it might not be wise to to sell it. So one of the things that I found really interesting was a an email that I got earlier this week, um, and the comment was sellers are responsible for the safety of everything they sell. And that was a fascinating statement to come from someone who is fairly high up at Amazon. And part of the reason why that's fascinating is because that didn't used to be Amazon's position itself, by the way. Um, they, they did not used to take that position and would, would push off the responsibility onto vendors and sellers. Um, they would take really great pains with their own products, like their own private label products, um, but not so much with anyone else's. They would push off the responsibility on them. So this whole year has been fascinating for us to watch with Amazon really taking responsibility for the safety of products and the platform and really taking responsibility for customer experience in terms of safety, not just quality. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, I don't know if you saw the question that came up, but Cordelia just asked, if you want to start a product, private little product, what is a good first step to learn about compliance? And I, and I think that's a wonderful question, especially if you have uh, any kind of like nascent idea that you're getting ready to, to start doing any hard work on, that should be one of the first questions you ask yourself is, what could I possibly <laughs> have to do with compliance with this? Do you want to kind of address her question a little bit in a general way? Yeah, absolutely. So the the very first thing I do, and I know it's kind of hilarious to think of it this way, is you actually just Google it. Uh, d Google the product name that you're looking for. So say if you want to do um, Christmas lights, um, Google Christmas lights and recall um, Christmas lights product safety hazard. Those those keywords, product safety hazard and recall, are going to pop up um, most of the situations that might come up in a in a print context. So like if someone were running an article at a local newspaper, then they might use the word recall or product safety hazard. Um, the other thing is if um, in, the, in the US it's really difficult because you have multiple agencies that are governing all of these things and not all of them, you know, as Emily has talked about, she's, she's been working on a ton of projects for clients where most of the issues that we're working on aren't checked by customs. Uh, very few things are checked by customs actually. So there's a lot of, of agencies in the US that are um, focused on making sure that things are legal and safe that don't ever get checked anywhere until after something bad happens. So with the CPSC, they govern most consumer products in the US, but say you're doing supplements, that's gonna be FDA. Um, say you're doing something that has a wireless device, that's FCC. So you do have to figure out which agency governs your product. But the very simplest way to start out is actually just to Google the words recall, <laughs> product right. safety hazard in the product. Um, there was a question about um, insurance, and there are some types of products for which you basically can't get insurance as a small seller. Um, you, you, you have, there, there's kind of a two-pronged approach to compliance, that just from a, a philosophical standpoint. You can have either the government enforce, or you can have lawsuits <laughs> enforce. Those are the two ways that, that product safety basically happens in the United States and, and all around the world. In most places around the world, um, product safety enforcement is done through government enforcement. And in some cases, government enforcement is very poor, and so it's not a very safe area to buy products. Um, in the US, there's a lot of product safety enforcement that's done by lawsuit. Um, we're a very lawsuit happy country. Uh, the average cost of a product liability lawsuit is about $8 million uh, for the total judgments that are awarded. It's, it's a huge problem if you're a manufacturer and you have two choices. You can either um, try to pay for the insurance, and in some cases it's just out of, out of reach. Um, we, <laughs> we asked the insurance agent that we work with for a client, we were like, um, so what would it cost to insure an electrical blanket? And he wrote back, <laughs> you're joking, right? And I was like, no, I'm not joking. And he was like, no, I'm not gonna try to insure that. So it just was impossible to insure. So what you would do in a case like that where something is so risky that they, they won't even insure it and then even if they do have a product liability insurance policy for it, it may not actually cover the cost of the recall, only the cost of um, injury lawsuits. So the, even then you have to really read the fine print. So what we recommend is just preventing the problem in the first place. That's a lot easier than ensuring against the problem happening um, and what to do if it does. So. With something like an electrical blanket, what we would do is, is recommend having really strong compliance procedures in place wherever your manufacturer is. 
um, making sure that you evaluate the, the raw materials that are being used, the thickness of the wire, the thickness of the insulation, all the different pieces that go into making whatever that particular widget is and understanding those pieces before making it. So if it's something really simple, like say you're doing household throw pillows, even household throw pillows have regulatory requirements for labeling and, um, and fiber content and registration requirements at the state level. But it's not exactly an unsafe product. Nobody accidentally died because of a throw pillow. <laughs> now, someone might have purposefully died. You know, there's like all those, those TV shows with the, the pillow on the face, whatever. That's, that's unforeseeable misuse. You can't protect against that as a manufacturer. As a manufacturer, you have to think of foreseeable misuse and unforeseeable misuse. If someone can foresee that it'll be misused and someone will be hurt, then that's your responsibility. And you can be sued for foreseeing potential misuse that can result in injury. So that, again, it's, it's, it's kind of silly, but Googling it really does help. There's so much more information out there than there used to be about issues. My very favorite was this story at a product safety conference. And I know those, are, those sound like a barrel of laughs, right? Um, was a story that, that we talked about, about this particular product that was out, I think it was in the early 90s. And the idea was to simplify the worm finding process. Um, by zapping open puddles in your yard with live electricity. So if anyone's ever um, thought about how close you have to get to said puddle to zap it um, and how electricity works, uh, the thing that's interesting is that there were over 100 people who got electrocuted before this thing got recalled. So that is kind of sad. Um, it's like the electrical version of lawn darts. <laughs> <laughs> and all for worms. Like, why couldn't you just dig them up, right? Um, but that's that's the kind of thing where now you can just Google it and find out what somebody else did that was incredibly stupid and not do it. Um, okay, there was a few questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, as far as insurance company problems, there's a particular test that's run in these kind of lawsuits. It's called um, the Do Care Test. So did you... Do um, did you perform your production with due care? And the concept of due care is whether you just buy it and sell it. So if we were talking about Christmas lights, if you were to just go over and um, go onto Alibaba and just buy some Christmas lights that looked good, ship it in and sell it on the website, no checking anything, no looking for UL 588. Um, Christmas lights are a substantial product safety hazard. They light on fire. I mean, it's something that Emily saw over and over. It's something I saw over and over. Christmas lights are not good. <laughs> Buy the ones with the UL sticker, please. Uh, your um, but the, the person who does this can get it air shipped without any sort of evaluation at the port. There's no requirement in the U.S. from a regulatory perspective. Um, it's more of a safety perspective. Anything that impacts customer, like a consumer life, if you will, somebody could die, then the agencies will get involved. So you could actually get this thing up and sell it without anyone um, doing any work on the compliance at all. And in that case, if somebody died, if, if their house burned down because of your Christmas lights that you imported, that you put your name on the clearance documents with the, the airway bill, they can sue you personally for that. So, um, and because nothing was actually done to verify compliance, no safety testing, no anything, then you could be found to be to have been exercising um, no due care. You didn't exercise due care in the launch of that product. Um, so we don't see that terribly often uh, at the agency level, but at the private lawsuit level that happens on a regular basis. And usually they're fairly small, but you don't want to be facing even a $20,000 lawsuit. That, that's not cool. Okay, so there was another question about choosing a good manufacturer. Um, let's see. So, so with uh, the manufacturing piece of it, it I would say it's a good manufacturer for the product that you're doing uh, is is the most important part of this. So, a good manufacturer for a scarf is going to be different than a good manufacturer for a children's bib, even if they're both made out of essentially the same material. Those those are going to be two different kinds of manufacturers you're looking for. With, with the scarf, with an adult scarf, you're just looking for someone who can sew a straight line and put a, a label on it and you're good, right? As long as they're honest with you about the fabric. With a children's product, you need to make sure that any um, fixings, any, any um, fastenings or um, anything that's added to it is compliant. Uh, you need to make sure there's a tracking label. There's a lot more stuff that goes into a children's product and you need to make sure that it's compliant with 
um, U.S. regulations there. So a factory that can do an adult scarf may not be the factory that can do the children's product. So I always start with the product, which is kind of funny because I know like everyone else, it's it's all over the Facebook groups, right? They're always like, I'm making a garlic press. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, a garlic press is regulated, right? Like you're touching food. You want to poison your garlic? So <laughs> whenever I start with a, with a widget, I'm always thinking, well, what does this widget do? How are people going to use right. it? What is the widget that you're trying to make? And if I don't know the widget, I can't help you. So it's always funny when uh, when people want to want to hide their product or do something really vague, like I'm doing something in the baby category. <laughs> like, okay, well that could be something really easy, like mom is carrying a bag and the baby never touches it, or it could be something really hard, like a binky. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's a um, it's a product thing, and based on the difficulty of the product, then you find a manufacturer that can meet that standard. If it's something like a children's product or an electrical product, I usually require um, that our, our sourcing consultant find a factory that has ISO 9001 certification. That's basically just quality management systems. They know how to manage things. That's it. They can push paper effectively. <laughs> That's what that certification means. Um, that doesn't mean they'll push your paper effectively, so you do have to still follow up on it, but it does mean that they can do what you're looking for. So that, that would be the way that I would say you'd want to first double check is ISO 9001 certification and then double check that it's actually legitimate because we have dealt with um, photoshopped ISO 9001 certs before. <laughs> okay, so um, I, apparently it's hard to kill worms, so very serious issue there. <laughs> Okay, so um, I wanted to get to the last two um, topics that we have. Um, so the China holidays and to talk a little bit about our um, upcoming conferences. So um, right now we're in the middle of another holiday. So um, Emily, I know this has been kind of a, a running joke for a while. So can you tell us a little bit more about the holidays that a lot of our, our private label sellers face? Yeah, so China goes on holiday an awful lot, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> and right now they're on holiday and uh, it's for a week. And so that's kind of a big deal if you're trying to get something manufactured and on the shelves in time for the holidays. Um, if you haven't allowed yourself enough time in your timeline um, from start to finish of your project, um, one week's time of everyone in the factory kind of hanging out and not being in the factory but being on a holiday um, could set you back quite a bit. And um, it's important to know. And so, um, yeah, I would highly suggest that when you are looking into the manufacture of a new product that you really sit down with a calendar and take a good hard look at um, realistic timelines in terms of how long things will take, um, you know, what, what the benchmarking process will look like, um, how long will it take to take a good hard look at the product that you want to make and what the specs are for that product. Um, and then is China going to be on holiday during any of that time? Uh, what about the product testing phase of things? So now that you have the product that you know you want to manufacture, um, you should have a sample tested. You should have it looked at and make sure that it's going to pass muster. Uh, will they be on holiday for that? And if so, that's going to set you back. You should really build in a lot of buffers into your timeline. So if you want something to be on the shelves for Christmas, you should really start thinking hard about that in springtime, early springtime, um, just to make sure that, you know, things like um, this holiday week that they're in now, they've been out since really last Friday. It's a week long, but uh, weekends don't really count. So they've left the office and on Friday and they're not going to be back until Monday. And when they do come back on Monday, there's going to be all of our clients and a whole bunch of other people who have been trying to get things manufactured or get their POs in and get their projects moving. And so they're going to come to inboxes that are full of hundreds of emails. And where does your email fall in that list of emails? So, um, yeah, I think the important lesson um, that some people are learning the hard way is um, to pay attention to when China will be on holiday because that's really going to affect you. And it's good to know up front so that you can just know, oh yeah, during this first week in October, it's always going to be like this. They, they have the same holidays every year. So, um, you know, you can, again, Google it. <laughs> Check the Google. 
and see what their calendar looks like and you know really do sit down with a marker and a paper calendar and plot it all out and you might be really surprised at how long it's going to take when you actually add in all that added information so yeah yeah, yeah. i mean when, when i was doing imports as opposed to um pl we did a lot of toy imports amazon of course uh big into toys in q4 lots of toy imports and those toy companies would actually start the process of um, product design and what they were going to choose for the year in February. Um, so while their factories were on Chinese New Year and they were off, they would be working on which products to prototype. Then in March, when the factories got back, they would be asking for prototypes and samples. They'd go through the sample process. And then by late April, early May, they'd already issued their POs for Q4. <laughs> So yeah. making sure that you have that that timeline in place. I know a lot of people are used to wholesale, and that's that's not how it works. You've got to have the cash flow to manage a PL business. Yeah, completely agree. Okay, cool. So um, the there a question came about brand registry. Um, so the the question was from Joe about uh, explaining brand registry in less than a minute. Uh, so what Amazon posts as being a requirement is that you have your own website and that you provide pictures of the product and the packaging. Um, that's all that they tell you. Uh, what you are not told is that the whole purpose of brand registry is to establish that you actually own the brand. Um, and all that that does is give you the opportunity to um, edit appropriately. And everyone, hi. Hi, <laughs> <Hello. laughs> One of the best things about working from home. Um, so, so what they're trying to do is establish that you actually own the, the brand registry uh, for that particular product, that you're not trying to steal somebody else's. So all of the information on the website needs to match what you submit on your packaging. If you have an address on your packaging, an address on Seller Central, and an address on the website, and they're all different, then that's a problem. If you have um, registration for a, uh, <laughs> if you have registration for another brand, so say you got an exclusive deal, then you need to provide a letter from them so that you have access to that. Mm -hmm. And again, you still need to have all the matching information on your website. Yeah, it's basically, I think, think of it similarly to the process of actually registering for your seller account. You want to make sure that your information is verifiable, that it lines up, that it makes sense. Um, but the, the process as Rachel described it is pretty much that. It's have all your ducks in a row and make sure that everything matches. Um, the areas that I've seen problems are if the product doesn't have a brand on the product itself. Some of them, it doesn't make sense. So some of them literally can't um, have products uh, be, be branded. So that can be confusing for the person reviewing it. Um, in other cases, it's okay for them not to be branded. So if you have like a, a, a cream in health and beauty, um, then you can't brand the cream. Right? It's, it's just a cream. So you'd end up needing to submit two pictures of your packaging. You should submit your inner packaging, the, the little tube thingy, and then the outer exterior box packaging, both of which should have your logo. So which is a good that's time the area where we see people kind of get tripped up is they'll, they'll have um, also stickers are, are out, but the packaging may not um, maybe maybe fully branded, but the product itself needs to be branded as well. Yeah, but it also brings up it's a good time to point out if you are doing private label and you have not yet thought about trademarking and getting a DMCA and other branding and all the legal things around your marks, please do that. The sooner that you start that process, the faster it will be for you to be able to protect those things when the inevitable person latches onto your listing. Amazon is not going to restrict your listing to just you, so you need to be prepared to do test buys if you do not have the appropriate protections legally for your marks and your name and all that good stuff. So that's a whole other ball of wax, but it is a, a part of being in the in the Amazon brand registries. You need to to really think about that just in general. But when you're in the in the registry, I think it's really important to have all that uh, done. But for private label in general, it's important to protect yourself. And one comment about brand registry in general is all that it does is give you editorial control. That's it. It doesn't yep. help protect you from somebody else listing on your site. You have to do the test by process. I highly, highly recommend signing up for Vendor Express and listing your products in Seller Central and in Vendor Express. If you have a Vendor uh, Central account, then list your products in both. Um, if you don't intend to sell it to Amazon, I suggest offering it at too high of a price for them to order it from you. 
then uh, you don't get the orders. Uh, but the whole point there is to make sure that you plant your flag in both locations so that you can maintain control of anything that's listed on the vendor side and on the seller side. The main concern that I have on the vendor side is that there was a situation about two months ago or so, around the same time as all the brand restrictions came out, where people were like, oh my god, Amazon is selling my listing, Amazon just hijacked me. First, Amazon doesn't care enough to hijack you. Uh, second, somebody figured out that they could list whatever they wanted in Vendor Central without any sort of proof that they own the product at all. And they were listing a bunch of people's products in Vendor Central and uh, Vendor Express, excuse me, uh, without the, the brand owner's permission. So always make sure that you list in the vendor and seller side. They're basically two separate companies as far as listings go. They don't overlap in terms of brand ownership. So just because you have brand registry in the seller side doesn't mean that you have the authoritative contribution for your listings on the vendor side too. Cordelia just asked something. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so for Vendor Central, you usually can't unless you're a big brand and you get invited. So you need to sign up for Vendor Express. And the sign up for Vendor Express is really easy. It's like five steps. <laughs> you literally just go to vendorexpress.amazon.com and sign up. It's, it takes 30 seconds. Um, the, the listing of the product, you put in your product name and your UPC, um, if that's what you've got. If it's uh, something that's, that's not listed in your product ID, then you use what you have. Um, so people who are brand registered who don't have UPCs have GTINs. Um, so you can use that and have that um, be listed in, in Vendor, Vendor Express as well. Um, but again, it's really, really important to stake your claim in both places. And then when you have um, your products listed in Vendor Express, if you just signed up, you can actually have your first five A-plus pages for free, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I think we're good on the questions. So I did want to get to the conferences. So I will be speaking in Hong Kong um, on the 17th or 18th. <laughs> it's for the Global Sources Conference, and um, we'll post that that link in um, the chat here. And then we will be going to London the following week, uh, Emily and I, to speak at the inaugural UK Sellers Conference. And we're doing that with um, Cynthia Stein, with uh, her partner Leslie Hensel, um, and with Georgia Merchant Words, with Jeff uh, Soto Labs. Um, and we have some really great sponsors there. So um, Emily, would you like to say anything about the, the conference? Uh, sure. <laughs> Some of it will be in London. We're looking forward to being there. Um, I will be speaking about project management, um, specifically how we help you manage your project um, from A to Z. So how uh, you can help us to help you, uh, how you can Google it, how you can uh, decide what products you want to sell, how you can make an intelligent and informed decision about what would be a wise um, first product, uh, second product. You know, if you've already manufactured something, you might want to go with something a little bit more complex. If it's your first project, maybe you want to stick with the adult scarf and not go with the child's baby, for example. Uh, so just simple ways that you can kind of help us to help you, and together we can manage your project and get you up and running. Awesome. So um, the Global Sources show in Hong Kong is primarily focused on sourcing. So if that's something that um, you're planning on doing, then that's a, an interesting show to join. The, the UK conference is primarily focused around um, basically being a seller in Europe. And so European sellers going to the US and then US sellers going to Europe. And what are the kind of the cross-border implications that are involved? One of our sponsors, um, I believe, uh, is World First. I hope I'm getting the name right. And they help with getting uh, bank accounts in different locations. That's one of the biggest problems that, that we see with the UK and the verification issues there. So you can see Kelly nodding. <laughs> <laughs> And you go into a little bit, just a quick like elevator speech on how the verification process works and why if you're going to go to the UK, this is so important. Sorry, I was on mute and I didn't even know it. High <laughs> level only. Um, think of it like this. <clears throat> the UK is 
it's very similar to the US, but it's also very different. And when it comes to the differences, it's usually in a regulatory capacity. And the UK has a set of regulations that are loosely called the KYC or know your customer. Amazon is required to identify you in different ways in the UK than is in the US. So for instance, when you register in the seller account community here, you're basically asked for your, your EIN or your social security number. Over there, they're actually looking to make sure, kind of like what we talked about with the ABR, does your name match this and does your business name verify and so on and so forth and is this your bank account and all of this information. You need to make sure that all of your identity information matches up and can be verified that they can understand where it's coming from. So if you have a state business license, uh, it needs to be called out as such and so on. If they are unable to verify that information, they will completely lock you out of your account. Not not usually without any warning. Generally speaking, there will be a conversation where they try to ascertain your identity and ask you some follow-up questions. However, that doesn't always happen. So uh, be very aware that going into the UK, you need, like Rachel said, or I believe they call it a registered agent. Um, that kind of helps you facilitate that with your bank account and having a presence where you're trying to sell so that they can actually verify who you are. Um, when in doubt, read all the help files because there's a lot of stuff on, on UK that will kind of illuminate some of these things, but you have to make sure that your documents match you, who you say you are and what you're trying to do. And that's really important uh, if you are trying to register as a pro seller, they consider you truly a business. You may not think of yourself as a business, but Amazon does, and they're going to be looking to identify who you actually are. Yeah, so a lot of the stuff that we, we've been seeing as a problem is people who deliberately have multiple accounts um, and their information doesn't match because, yep. of course, their account names aren't matching the rest of their names. <laughs> yeah. That's obviously yeah. a problem, so you need to make sure everything matches. Um, and just in general, a lot of the things that we've seen happen are just because of, of people struggling with um, the differences of, of doing business in another country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and don't forge your document documents. That would be the other thing I would say. Um, Why not? Well, I know it's so much fun to do that. Um, however, I actually have seen sellers who, for whatever reason, were they didn't want to reveal certain things, and so they gave Amazon manufactured documentation, and then they got locked out of their account, shockingly. Um, so don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And just know that if you are planning of branching out from North America into EU or into any other of the other localities, the Far East, the Amazon offers, there are going to be different challenges, not just from being identified and, and whatever uh, identity requirements exist in that locality, but also from a regulatory standpoint and from a customer service standpoint. So just those are all things to think about, that cross-border implication. I love the way that Rachel said that's very true. Um, so we did have one last question, um, and I did post both of the links for the events, the Global Sources Summit in Hong Kong and the UK Seller Conference in London. So if you ever wanted to take an international trip and uh, have a tax write-off, then... That's the one for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question was, does Amazon have plans to expand into 3P sellers? And I suspect not. Um, part of the reason is um, I expect not right now. Um, I'll qualify that. Uh, right now, it's one of the benefits of being a vendor, and vendors do have to pay more on a per product basis for the privilege of selling their product on Amazon. It is more, um, you, you do make more profit per item on most items as a seller than as a vendor. Um, so the, the challenge there is that right now only vendors have it. It's a really huge benefit for vendors, uh, especially now that sellers can't use third-party sites to kind of boost their product. Now only Amazon is in the game of boosting your product. That's a really huge incentive to join Vendor Central if you get invited, right? That, that's a, it's a really positive, oh, okay, that's a good reason for me to go into Vendor Central. Um, I suspect if they did roll it out to, to sellers that it would be somewhat similar to the way that Vendor Express has A-plus content. Vendor Central has beautiful A-plus content, drag and drops. Um, you get these charts, they're gorgeous, and there's like whole different things with like links that you can do and cool pictures and everything. Vendor Express has one template and you have to submit it in Word. <laughs> so it's, it's there, it's, it's functional, it does what it needs to do, and it looks good, but it's not nearly as nice as what you get as a vendor. So I suspect that if they roll out Vine, it'll be somewhat similar to that where it'll be like Vine Lite. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think because the blog post is specifically mentioned about making Vine more useful. And I, I agree with Rachel. I think that while changes are going to be coming, it may not be immediately, and it's certainly not going to be up to the same level as what is available on the vendor side. Okay, I think uh, that's that's it for the questions so far. If you have a question, then speak now or <laughs> forever hold your peace. Um, we do plan on having more of these and discussing um, important issues for, for Amazon sellers as we see them and as they come up. And thank you so much for attending our, our first uh, little event here. So thank you, and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Bye, everyone.